Hi, everybody, and welcome to Veterans Corner. Boy, we got a surprise for you today. We have, uh, I would like to say, a celebrity with us. Uh, how's that, Tony? Yeah, Tony right. Enos, who's a, a marina, a submariner, who got some great stories for it. But I think before we get into that, that there's so many stories, and we have a lot of pictures which we're going to capture, is that uh, he was aboard the Sea Lion from the very, very beginning till the end of the Sea Lion, yeah. which, by the way, for all those marine, uh, submarine lovers, it's at the bottom of the Narragansett Bay, which uses a target ship, and or the 40, 74, or something like that. 78. 78. 78 it was used for. But I think the interesting, there's so many things that are interesting about Tony's life, Tony's career, and so many, and being on a submariner, which is the silent service, which we've talked about with Jackie Owls, my pal here. Uh, we talk about, it was such a silent service, they didn't get credit for the fact that they got rid of 30% of the Japanese fleet. Uh, you know, it's such a secret that, you know, nice, it'd be nice if we told the public now today that they got rid of 30% of the Japanese fleet. But I think the one of the, one of the ones that would stick out for moviegoers and people that uh, would, would remember the, uh, the bridge over the River Kwai. This is a book that's in the Somerset Public Library, library as we're uh, filming in the Somerset Public Library. But in the book, at the back page, there is a um, people who were very much uh, a part of, uh, of the evacuation of the prisoners that were held at the prison, uh, Japanese prison camp in, in their quest to, unfortunately, to build the bridge over the River Kwai. And right here, it says right here, on the sea lion, Anthony Enos, Anthony W. Enos. Between, he turned from the River Kwai. And Good book. Anthony was on that submarine that took those prisoners aboard and, the, and get them set, get their life back and drop them in Saipan. You served mostly, Tony, in the, uh, by the way, how do you get in the submarine service? Well. <laughs> First of all, I, I was drafted, yep. uh, and uh, when I went to the Fargo building for my examination, if you passed the physical and the mental, they gave you a choice of service, okay. and um, I asked for the Navy. Mm -hmm. So I was sent over to the Navy recruiter, and he asked me, why did I want to go into the Navy? And I told him I thought I was going to volunteer for submarines because I had a fascination for submarines as a young man, and that's how I got into the submarine service. I went to Newport for my boot training, and when I finished my boot training, they uh, just before I finished my boot training, they put a notice on the bulletin board, anybody volunteered for submarines, put the name down. And I put my name, and one other fellow in my company put his name down. And true to, to the statistics, only 50% of a pass. He failed, and I went to New London to learn submarine and submarine diesel. Uh, when I uh, completed my courses, uh, I asked for new construction, and I asked for new construction at electric boat, and I was fortunate. I got assigned to the USS Sea Lion, who was that was still in the on the ways, uh, and I stayed with it from beginning to decommissioning at the end of the war. But we made six war patrols in the Pacific. Our first war patrol, we sunk four ships. We were in the company of two other submarines, which, by the way, a little later on, one of those submarines never came back. Our second war patrol was the war patrol in which we sunk the, uh, the prisoner of warship. We didn't know it was a prisoner of warship. She was in a convoy, and we were, there were two other submarines in the wolf pack, and we sunk it, and three days later, uh, we got radio message from the Pampanito, another submarine in a wolf pack, asking for assistance because they found a lot of people in the water. And uh, the we American boys are in the, who was in the water? American? A, a, a British and Australian. Australian. Okay. Uh, they had been captured by the Japanese, Japanese at the fall of Singapore. I got it. And they were building a railroad through Burma for the Japanese. It was slave labor. Uh, they were course. dying like flies. Uh, and. Uh, we didn't know they were aboard the ship. If we did, we wouldn't have torpedoed that ship. Uh, uh, we started to pick them up, and most of them were very, very ill. They had everything wrong with them, and they were the better ones of the survivors. They were being shipped to Japan to work in the mines because they were still able to walk. Yep. And um, uh, the Pampanito went through the area that we had sunk the ship and found a lot of people in the water. So they picked up one of them because one of them started hollering, you sink us one day and you're going to shoot us the next day. So they picked them up and they found out who they were, British and Australian prisoners of war of the Japanese. 
And I'll be paying for you. Very appreciative, Tony, I imagine. Yes. I imagine you appreciate oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, they were half dead, most of them, really. Yep. They picked up 74. Now, that's a lot of people to put on a submarine that's already got 80 people. Right. And then they radioed for us for assistance. We were about 200 miles away from there. Captain put on four speeds, and we do about 20 miles an hour. And we got to the area just before dark. And we picked up 54. And there was a typhoon building, and we knew that. And the captain decided it's getting dark. Uh, we've, we've, we're full with the people we've got. Uh, all I need to do is get hit by a, an airplane or a Japanese submarine, yep. and I lose my crew, I lose my ship, my crew, and the people who survived. So that's it. And when we left, we had people still in the water crying, over here, pick us up, over here. We had no choice but to go. And we went to Saipan. It took us a week to get there. We had a DE come out to meet us with a doctor on board. And the doctor was transferred onto the sea line to help the pharmacist mate, because we don't have doctors on submarines. Yep. And um, we lost four on the way to, to Saipan. Saipan. Uh, two of them, we didn't know who they were. They were buried at sea, put into a mattress sack with a four inch shell, and with a little ceremony, dropped into the sea. Uh, two of them, no, no, no names. They had no name tag on them, and they weren't talking. Um, following the, the uh, second war patrol, uh, we went to Pearl Harbor, where we stayed in the Royal Hawaiian Hotel for a two-week rest period, which every submarine uh, sailor got after a war patrol. And we went out on our third war patrol, and we took with us the first war correspondent allowed to ride a submarine. He, on the way to Midway, where we top off our fuel, because that brings us closer to the enemy, yeah. uh, he had put aboard uh, the most uh, modern wireless equipment, and uh, the crew in the forward torpedo room started to tell him that <laughs> this captain was going to kill us because he was very daring. We were a hot boat. We had already sunk 10 ships and two war patrols, and he believed it, but they were, they were just trying to rattle his cage. Okay. He would go no further. We got to Midway and he got off. That was the farthest he <laughs> was going to go. So he wanted to cover it, but not that much. Yeah, that's true. So when we left Midway, uh, we had a lot of problems. It was a good war patrol at the end, but uh, during the war patrol, we had a lot of problems. Uh, we ran into a, um, a freighter, not, not even a freighter, uh, no, gosh, a trawler. And it was a Japanese trawler. And the captain decided, well, we'll knock it off with our deck gun. Well, I had been a reload on the 20 millimeter gun crew and the first war patrol. All the rest of the war patrols, I was the gunner. So up on deck, you shoot these guys. So the four inch gun couldn't hit them. And, could, and the seas were a little bit rough. And they got close enough, and they were coming to do battle. And uh, I thought I was hitting them with the 20 millimeter, but they were also hitting us. And the captain decided, it wasn't worth getting any of our crew members killed for the sake of a small thing. So we broke off the engagement. And then we uh, headed toward uh, Formosa, uh, which is Taiwan now. Yep. And uh, I don't know whether we were supposed to patrol off the East Coast, but I, I assumed that's where we were to patrol. We saw nothing. And during one of our periods, we had a uh, torpedo uh, drill and we did everything was being done as if it was for real, except the doors were closed. And one of the officers accidentally hit the, but the button and fired a torpedo out through our after torpedo door, ripped the outer door, and uh, that meant we had no ability to go deep because the, yeah, the, right. out the outer door held the water out, and the inner door was a double protection. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's nothing could be done. The captain was annoyed, but uh, it's done. So we patrolled for a while, and the captain, he was a very daring man. Along the coast of Japan, the islands that followed Japan, Japanese were mining the shallow waters. And we knew they were, they were, they were uh, shallow waters because they were told by intelligence, don't go into that area, it's dangerous. And the captain decided to go in because he knew the ships that were going to be sunk would have been on inside, in between Formosa and the China coast. And sure enough, we one night we pick up on radar uh, 
seven ships in formation. They were big ships. At first we thought it was the island of Formosa, and the captain said, no, that's too far away, it can't be. And then one of the radar men says, well, if it's, uh, if it's land, it's moving. So we knew it were ships. <laughs> <laughs> so the captain raced ahead to try to get in position to fire at these ships. We didn't know what it was, except we knew that they were big. And when we get closer, it looked like a formation of seven ships. It looked like a cruiser. It looked like two battleships with three to four destroyers on the outskirts. And I found out after the war that it wasn't just two battleships. It was actually three battleships. The first one was the light cruiser, the Agi, and then it was the Congo, and then they had the Nagato, a battleship, and then they had the Yamato, which was the biggest battleship in the world, and following them were the destroyers. So when the destroyers started to move in towards where we were, uh, the captain decided... Were they aware that you were there? No, they were not aware. They were not aware. We had them on radar, and we didn't, we couldn't understand why they didn't. But no submarine had been in that area before, so uh, they were complacent that they were, they were safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the uh, captain decided to set the torpedoes at eight foot depth because uh, it, would be, it would knock off a destroyer if it didn't do much to the battleship. But when he fired it, I think he was sorry because he aimed at the battleships and eight feet is not deep enough to do much damage to them. But we got three hits on the first battleship and the second one that we fired at, the torpedo missed only because the battleship turned okay. and it went on to hit a destroyer in the back. They still didn't know what hit them and they started to pick up speed to get out of the area. They didn't know if it was They there. weren't trying to go after you, they just wanted to get out of there. We were still chasing them and they were trying to run away but because they didn't know what, the, what had done it. At first they thought it might have been aeroplanes because they started firing aircraft, yep. anti-aircraft. They started dropping depth charges, and uh, they were just trying to get away. Yep. And we continued to chase after them. And uh, after about three to four hours, they were getting away from us, but then they'd slow down. And we knew one of them was hurt bad, and then they'd pick up speed again. And finally, about five o'clock in the morning, five, five thirty, the battleship that we had hit exploded, stopped dead, and then it exploded, and inside of one minute, it was gone. We didn't know what sunk it, but we found out later that the... Hit the ammo. Yeah, it was the ammo inside that uh, fell over and blew up. The, the, uh, the torpedo didn't, didn't sink it. Uh, it was there trying to get away from us. The faster they traveled, the more water they took on until the ship got uh, uh, bow heavy and she leaned over and the ammunition that she had aboard must have toppled over and exploded because in one minute she was gone from the radar screen. Uh, we continued to chase after them, but it was getting light. We looked, the captain decided to search the area to see whether we can get a, pick up any debris to confirm our sinking. Yep. Uh, it, there was nothing to pick up. There was oil in barrels and stuff, but nothing that we could pick up. And then we had to get down underwater because it was getting light. We were close to Formosa. Japanese planes were going to come out. Oh, we, did we have Formosa? Was no, Formosa was Japan. Still Japan. It was still Japan. So we dove, and uh, we had to clean up because we were chasing after the battleship, and the seas were getting rough. And there's only one hatch open on the submarine when you're on the surface, and that's up in the conning tower. And the water was coming down there, and it was shorting out some of our electronic okay, equipment. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we, we uh, got through the war patrol, uh, and reported the sinking of a battleship. And the destroyer, we weren't sure of. We saw the explosion, but then it was bright light and then just as fast, nothing. Yeah. So we found out later on that the destroyer got hit and she might have been, might have had her depth charges ready to go off. And probably hit them. When yeah. the torpedo hit it, she just disappeared. One blow and gone. What's the arsenal look like for the torpedoes? How many, do you see, how many did the Sea Lion carry in that encounter? We how many carried 24 torpedoes 24 on the submarine. Torpedoes. Yeah. Did you discharge you all of them in that, in that ten, with a, We have 10 tubes, and you have those filled, and you have uh, that, so that's t uh, 10 and 14 are carried inside. I got you. Yeah, and when you fire at, at big targets, you fire a, a volley of torpedoes. I see, so you, so you get them, so it's like you bracket it, you bracket it, yeah. like a mortar. Yeah. You bracket it. This is true. This is true. This is, I just want to take an interrupt. I don't want to interrupt. You're fascinating. You're fascinating. I want to stop. This is a picture of, of you uh, way down the end. There's a little uh, sign that says, 
That's Tony. Yeah. But it's yeah. a me. It says a me. But that's the crew of the sea, uh, sea Lion. That's correct. That's the crew. And this one here is, uh, is the picture of the Sea Lion at sea. At sea. Yeah. And that's the Sea Lion at sea, folks. And that, that was Tony's home for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And this is somebody playing a joke on Tony about how he works, works around the clock, <laughs> doing just about everything. But he never found out to this day, as we are in 19, 2014, who the guy that wrote this or yeah. drew this, OK? This is a, re, 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 uh, re, was a reunion in Baltimore with uh, members of the crew. Is that the idea? Just the officers and Just the office, office and yourself. So uh, the I reason I wanted to pitch it, Tom, is that I was friendly with a former German U-boat commander that sunk the only battleship in the Mediterranean, and I wanted to send him a picture of our crew. I got it. Oh, that's cute. So that was taking place there. And uh, we have a few things. I think this is one, if I can capture this. We talked about the River Kwai. Yeah. The bridge in the River Kwai and how they were taking uh, uh, prisoners who, uh, who escaped, or at least you, you who took. Who were in the water. In the yeah. water, and they took them out of the way. They were bailing, they were taking 70 some men aboard a, a, a submarine, which is difficult with a crew of over 80. Uh, and to take them, and then they got out typhoon weather and so on. So they got to save these, mostly Australian and English. British, Australian British. and British, yeah. Okay. Oh, the Pampanito picked up 60, uh, 74, I believe, and we picked up 54. Oh, 54, okay. But it was getting dark, and we were uh, alerted that the typhoon was coming, and the captain decided that was it. Yeah. So there you are. If you can get all this picture, you see that, that that's a fact. And by the way, don't forget that uh, this library, the Somerset Public Library, as other libraries, holds the book uh, River Kwai, across the River Kwai. And you will see that Tony's name is in the end of that book, in the index of part of the submarine crew who saved these uh, uh, sailors, uh, saved these just British ships. Those guys were full of oil and everything. You guys had to clean them up. Oh, and yeah. Everything. Oh yeah, that crew. You got to give these guys a lot of credit. I do. I got when he was telling me about how he had to go up on a deck, and uh, get because of being under with the underwater for so long and not being able to get out. That you know you had oil and you said like that. And then the other one. This is the. That's the German U-boat. This is the German U-boat. This is the Battle of the Atlantic, World War Two. Yeah. Not your theater of war though. Your theater no, of war was the Pacific. I, right? I just became friendly with that particular submarine captain who was now an American citizen. Okay. I understand he just died. Is he uh, a German? He was a German? He, he was, was a German U-boat U -boat commander. commander. Yeah. He served in the German U-boat fleet from the beginning to the end, one of the very few that survived the whole war. Oh, I got to tell you. know about him. He wrote the book Iron Coffins, Herbert Werner. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. So he, they had quite a submarine fleet. Yeah. He had, he had stayed at my house one weekend, and I stayed at his house down in uh, Delaware, I believe it was Delaware, uh, New Jersey, I'm sorry, uh, for one weekend. We became fairly good friends for a short period of time. Nice, nice. I'm still going through these pictures here, I'm fascinated. Now this is, is this you, Tony? Yeah, no, that's him, that's uh, Herbert Werner, that's a picture. Right, that's the German U-boat commander, yeah. who was your friend that you yep. met who's deceased. Yeah. But he was in the, uh, uh, the wolf pack, if you will, in, uh, in the uh, Atlantic he Ocean. He gave me the picture, and, uh, and he signed it. Uh, and, and I kept it over the years. I've lost track of him, though. But I understand that he just died. He would right. have been 93 if he was still living. <coughs> Submarine, the silent service. When you look at the thing and you say it was a silent service, this one here. That's in the Fall River paper back in 1978 when the book, The River Kwai, okay, was being publicized. All right. And uh, one of the reporters at the Far River Herald uh, read it, and he came over to interview me, and he interviewed another fellow by the name of, um, uh, it's, it's on there, uh, gosh, on the next page, Robinson. who lived in Swansea. Robinson. Uh -huh. Robinson. Robinson, Isaac yeah, Robinson. Yeah, I saw it. Robinson was uh, it's a picture of him as a younger man. Uh, where oh, do yes. you know him from? Was it with the banks? He's a Fall River guy, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, Isaac Robinson. He worked for the gas company, I believe, here in Fall River. Yeah. And I didn't know him That's before. That's him right there. Yeah. I didn't know him before the war, and we became fast friends as a result mm -hmm. of uh, us being involved in, in this particular rescue. 
Yeah, I died a relatively young man. I think he was in his mid-60s when he passed on. I'm not stealing all your lines, am I, Tony? Yeah. I'm not stealing you, sure? Uh, yeah. I'll just get a picture here of, uh, and this would be aboard the... Um, lionfish. This is not aboard the lionfish, yeah. yeah. Who are the two people, may I ask? Yeah, uh, this is Ernie Gifford, who became like a brother. Uh, the both of us got involved in submarine veterans of World War II. He became a state commander, and after he got done, I became state commander for four or five years. Mm -hmm. And we were having our first reunion, a Northeastern re reunion, and we had a great time, and that was the article that was put forth. And the second page, you have some of the dignitaries that showed up. Uh, at, uh, we, we got, the first one was the submarine commander that sunk the biggest ship ever uh, on the high seas by a submarine. The next man had a Congressional Medal of Honor, and then you had Paul Weisses, who was the director of the battleship, right. Right. myself, and then Herbert Werner, the U-boat commander that we just talked about, and the other fellow was the educational coordinator at the Boston Science Museum, uh, a fellow by the name of Mr. King, he was a submariner during the war. Many submariners around here, Tony? And Are there many, or were there many submariners around quite here? Quite a few. And quite a few. Uh, yeah, in what respect? Or, uh, oh, well, I mean, I mean uh, the people that were in that theater of war. Oh, submariners? Submariners like uh, you. They're, they're dying off, they very few. Well, wow, I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. But this is, what would this be called? This is a Japanese? Battleship. Battleship. Congo. Yeah. This is where you sunk this ship. Uh, we sunk it on, on our, our third war patrol. Uh, it was on November the uh, 21st, 1944. Uh, we made an attack on that ship with two other battleships and about four destroyers and one, uh, one, one cruiser. And we hit it, with, we think we hit it with three, three torpedoes. We hear the three explosions. And the last torpedo we fired from the stern tube went past the second battleship in formation that it was aimed at, and it yeah, hit no. a destroyer on the flanking end of it, and it, that disappeared with one, one stroke. Uh, and we feel that the, uh, the depth charges were set to go off, and when that torpedo hit, it was a massive explosion. It just disappeared in a second. Tony, were the Japanese proficient at depth charges? Uh, they, Germans they, were, weren't they? Yeah, well, uh, the, uh, the Germans, no, the Germans went, uh, they didn't use depth charges as much. They had the submarine fleet. The, uh, the Allies became very, uh, very efficient in the sinking of submarines as the war continued. In, in, Atlantic, but it was, in Atlantic? It was because of the scientific improvements that were made. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the German submarines, a lot of them were sunk with the torpedo known as the Fido. It was a small torpedo, probably about eight feet long dropped from airplanes like a depth charge, and when it, uh, when it was dropped where the German submarine just dove, as soon as it hit the water, it would pick up the sound and chase after it yeah. and, wow. and sink it. Uh, this was advancements that... Uh, oh, sure was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they were having a field day on the mar maritime yeah. service for the yeah. longest time. The we were doing good with Same our thing. boats, and yeah. Tony can tell you why we lost some of our boats. Well, uh, It's got to be. Yeah, well, part of the story is... Uh, uh, the America, the Japanese uh, didn't realize that our submarines were, could go as deep as they did. Okay. They had depth charges, but they didn't make them big enough. Uh, they would uh, depth charge a submarine, and they would stay until they thought they sunk it, and some of the times they didn't. They left too early. Um, they found out differently. Uh, we had a congressman, and I don't know the name, but he was privileged to sit in on a high echelon submarine group, and he asked the question, how come the Germans were losing so many submarines and we were not losing many of our own? And he was told that the Jap what the Japanese weren't doing right, and they weren't them, dropping them deep enough, they weren't making them big enough, and when he got through with the meeting, he went out and had a news conference. And told them. And, yep. and, told and you them. lost 10 boats. And, and then uh, uh, quite a few submarines, I believe it was 10, that were lost shortly thereafter, because the Japanese read newspapers too. Oh, they sure do. Yeah. They yeah. sure do. Yeah. The, um, uh, this, uh, you're, you're such a, such a good, great guest. You have so much to talk about. You gave me the best half hour I've had in my life. Yeah. No, <laughs> it is. <laughs> you did. Half hour went by like that, didn't it? Uh, I'll buy like that. Yeah. The, what's, you find so much difference in the service today with the submarines. Uh, 
Do you actually still put your hand in that or know what's happening or stay with that, with the growth? No, I've stayed very closely to the submarine community for years, especially when I was involved in submarine veterans of World War II. Yeah. Uh, there's not too many of them uh, that are around, you know, the submarine veterans that are around now, and I'm, I'm losing contact with them. I do have a few friends that, that, that uh, serve on modern day submarines. Yeah. Uh, they don't talk too much about them because they're nuclear and they've got to keep quiet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. What a difference, huh? Yeah. What a difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're, they're no matter go is a lookout and on a conning tower of a submarine and to have the sun at least in oh, yeah. wash the sun wash up the boils on your back for being under that underwater right. for a yeah. long period of time while chasing yeah. Japanese yeah. Uh, destroyers. Uh, yeah, you're, you're very, very, very true. I, uh, sometimes I lose train of thought. I'm getting <laughs> old. That's okay. <laughs> um, getting oh, yeah. Uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, each of our first three war patrols, we were in a coordinated group. This is called a wolf pack in the German Navy. Right. Uh, we didn't operate together. We operated in a grid, probably 20, 30 miles square. Into, and after, we never lost a submarine while we were in that particular wolf pack. group. Yeah. But the next war patrol, one of the submarines that was with us never came back. Three war patrols in a row. One of the submarines that operated with us, when they went out the second time, they never came back. Well, well, was there a to how many was the total of the number of submarines? So the total submarines, 52 were lost. Two were lost. But two of them sunk themselves with boomerang torpedoes, torpedoes that uh, right. turned around and, and came back and hit them. Huh. Uh, two of them uh, were sunk by friendly forces. One of them, I had seen the boat just before she left New London, and she was bombed by an American airplane before she got to Panama. A and another one uh, was in an area that a Japanese submarine had sunk, uh, an American DE, and the word didn't get to the task force that was in that area that there was an American submarine having trouble with the weather and she was slow. And they picked her up on sonar, and even though she tried to uh, alert them through sonar that just pinpointed them and they dropped a lot of hedgehogs on her and sunk her with 18, I think it was 18 extra people on board, soldiers that were being transferred from one area to another. So we lost 52 boats all told. Uh, submarine service is a dangerous service. It sure is. Uh, number one, you're working in another environment. You're not on top of the water, you're underneath it, just like an airplane. We get paid extra hazard pay for being on submarines. And you have to be silent. Uh, yeah, yeah. It can't be because of radio contact yeah. and pinpointing yourself and you never yeah. know what's out there uh, yeah. getting it. And you're, you're usually out there alone. There's nobody to help you. Even if, I, I used to hear uh, uh, submarines being depth charged and we knew that he was in an adjoining area. Dep depth charges, you can hear them for, for a long distance. And we would say, well, somebody's getting worked over Nothing we can do about it. No. And if he was sunk, uh, there's yeah, nothing we could do it. He'd have to save like himself. Like saving lives. You can yeah. only get some. Uh, only lives. one submarine had uh, survivors come up from a sunken submarine. Uh, and the last man out was a Portuguese fellow from uh, California, Jesse de Silva. And uh, uh, that was an experience that I've always said, but for the grace of God, go I. Right. Uh, being sunk in deep water, in enemy waters, and having to use a monsoon lung to get out into the open sea, scary, oh, scary, to say the least. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I think f I think twelve tried to make it from the submarine, and I think only five of them got to the surface alive. Yeah. Well, Tony Enos, an American hero, a warrior, a complete warrior. If you want to look and read and see what to say is factual, you'll see some of the pictures that we showed you here. Uh, with picking up the survivors of the prisoners from the bridge over the River Kwai. And in that Pacific theater of war, he was a submariner from the beginning to the end. Sea Lion, its first voyage to its last voyage. Tony was on it. And this library here and many libraries around the country and movies have been made with uh, not so much featuring Tony, although it should feature a lot more people out of the silence, uh, silent service. Um, of, of retrieving our American, our British counterparts, our Australian counterparts, and our American boys out of the seas after Japanese captivity. So if you can get this book, you'll see Tony at the very beginning under the sea line. But it's not just the book, it's the individual. Tony, thank right. you so much Welcome. for a great day.
a Thank great you. day. Thank, Thank you very much. Back east. Back east. Thank you very Tommy. much. Thank you very much. And so long from Veterans Corner.